Northeast, especially in the state of Manipur that we are talking about. Uh, most of us, I believe, have had the occasion to visit uh, different parts of the Northeast at one time or the other. And uh, I started visiting the area uh, in the 90s, actually, and or maybe 89 was the first visit. Uh, and it usually so happens that we, we go to Assam first, you know, we go to uh, Guwahati first, uh, and because of the air link as well, you know, it's a convenient air link. And then uh, for many of us, the next step is to go to Meghalaya, to Shillong, because it's, it's a very important, uh, uh, I would say, educational uh, capital of that region. And uh, I believe was the capital of the undivided region at one time under the, I mean, right till the 60s, I suppose. And then we make our way to other parts of the Northeast. Uh, for instance, I've been to Tripura, which I discovered is, is totally different. It's very different from, say, Nagaland or Mizoram. And uh, it's, uh, Tripura is, was a princely state, uh, largely Bengali speaking with a considerable um, indigenous or tribal population. And I actually happened to go uh, to the border, you know, to the Bangladesh border, which is right there uh, in Tripura. And when you land at the airport, somebody told me just across from the airport is the border. And I'd been to the Atari border uh, near Pakistan, and uh, it was a very different experience on the Bangladesh border and the uh, Pakistan border. I can tell you uh, in Tripura, we had a friendly exchange with people. They crossed over, we shook hands and so forth. And uh, then other parts of the Northeast like Arunachal are very different. So the first point I want to make is that uh, making generalizations about that region is, uh, is fraught with danger. We cannot generalize. It is an extremely diverse part of the country. And uh, the diversity is much greater than in mainland India, right? I mean, if you travel from Delhi to Kolkata, you, you see so much diversity, right? But uh, when you travel within the, uh, the Northeast, the diversity is far greater. So that's the first point that, uh, that I uh, realized many, many years ago. Uh, the second point uh, that, that uh, struck me uh, especially when I went to Arunachal, where, where Abhishek Ji is there, uh, I was told that many people have declared Hindi as their mother tongue in Arunachal, and it, which was also very interesting for me. The Hindi was obviously different from the one we speak. Uh, and you need an inner line permit. I had an amazing experience because I, I landed in the North Lakhimpur airport and uh, I, I found it was raining, you know, as they say, it was raining cats and dogs. And uh, all that I saw was some uh, CRPF personnel with huge dogs. And the, uh, the plane was practically empty. There were very few people. Uh, and then I sort of generally went up to them and said, what are you looking for? And they gave me one of those looks, you know, and without answering, uh, the man pointed to a really run-down, ramshackle type of, a, uh, you know, it's like an auto, but more like a tempo, you know. He said, sir, So I went to that uh, ramshackle auto type of place, and there was already a gentleman sitting there. So I walked two steps back because I wanted to be polite. But that man called me, said, come, come, aye, aye. I said, Namaste, aap kaha ja rahe hain? So he said, aapko jahan bhi jana, pehle aapko isme bahe, you know? So I got into that and then, well, eventually we reached Agartala. It was a real adventure. Uh, not, not Agartala, sorry, Itanagar, sorry. So these were very interesting experiences. And then uh, Shillong, I have been going, I have friends there, uh, poets and writers. And I'll come to that in a moment because it's linked to the topic. But even in Arunachal, I saw that there was a lot of evangelical activity. Okay, I stayed in the in the Dono Paulia Ashok, and 
And right outside, there was a huge evangelical gathering on loudspeakers uh, and uh, in bamboo huts, you know. Uh, and somebody was joking. And I said, why, why is it so loud? So, they, so the person said, look, may, maybe they think that if the volume goes up, you know, God will hear them more easily, you know. So it was a very uh, interesting experience for me to go to, the, to that part of uh, India. Uh, and then the final thing I wanted to say in connection with the thesis is that uh, I've guided a lot of research uh, by students of the Northeast. My last student from there was Gertrude, who is Desmond Karmaflong's daughter. She did a project on the Northeast. I've done two or three projects on Manipur, uh, two or three on Mizoram. And uh, the Mizo project for me was, was so fascinating because I discovered that the Mizos were a singing tribe. That's what I was told. And they sing, uh, and in Shillong also, there's a beautiful choir. But uh, in, in Mizoram, I, when I found out, I, I, it was fascinating for me, that the church was so powerful that they had banned Hindi movies in Mizoram. So I don't know if it has changed now. But if you go to Mizoram, you won't be able to see Hindi movies. I, 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 you know, I don't know, as I said, if it's changed today. And there's a whole history of... Uh, of conversion in that part of India. Uh, and it happens after, you know, uh, the British eased up on anti-missionary activities. Until the 1830s, a little bit, uh, you know, Dalrymple and others have also written about it. The British were primarily uh, traders. They wanted to make money. And the East India Company uh, started raising armies to protect the economic interests. But after they defeated the Marathas, I believe in 1818 was the third battle, they slowly allowed missionary activities. Earlier, they were in a place called Sri Rampur or Serampur, as it was called. It was a Dutch territory. And there were very famous missionaries there, Baptists, uh, I think Joshua, uh, Ma I mean Ward and Marshman, you know, William Ward, Joshua. Uh, so, th so these were... Baptist missionaries, William Carey, I think, and Joshua Marshman, if I remember right. Uh, and then the missionary activities in the 1860s, 70s increased. And in the Northeast, uh, they reached a certain level. And then after independence, or a little bit before that, Ramakrishna mission, other organizations started going there. So, so when Dr. Sampson's uh, project came to us, I found that this was one of the first ones to deal with uh, the so-called Hindu missionaries, Hindu, uh, that is non-Christian, uh, uh, you know, organizations who were doing work in that area. And I found that there's a lot of scope for research uh, to understand the relations between, uh, between the indigenous communities, the tribal communities, their own versions of Christianity on the one hand, and other religions that are practiced there and these organizations. Some of them have been there for a number of years. But the last point I wanted to make is I was in Shillong a couple of years ago, and uh, I think it was 2018. Uh, there was a very big cultural uh, study seminar there. And uh, I, uh, as usual, you know, I was talking to people, and they, they told me that the new movement uh, in the Northeast is a retribalization movement. So the first move was to move from the indigenous tribal roots to Christianity. And, uh, and that was a, a means of, you know, it was a kind of civilizing mission as far as the missionaries were concerned, the colonial administration was concerned. And now there's a return to the roots. That is what I was told. Uh, and uh, uh, the fascinating th thing for me as a student of literature and someone who's guided research is almost the first written texts in many of these uh, regions and communities. The first one was the Bible, and the second one is Shakespeare. So uh, on that note, I invite uh, uh, Dr. Samson Kamai to share his research with us. Uh, once again, uh, uh, Dr. Kamai, I know you've had some difficulties in the last few months. I'm sorry about that, but I'm really looking forward to the completion of your work. And as I told you, uh, if, if uh, what you produce is of a high quality, then everybody will refer to your work because it'll be the first one 
on that topic. And I'm very, very happy that, uh, 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 that Dr. Vimusa is going to chair this. He's an authority on the Northeast. His work uh, uh, on uh, Naga activism, identity, is, is fabulous. Uh, and uh, I think that he, he commands a respect in the entire region for his work, in addition to deontic logic, which is very abstract, quite abstruse, and so forth. So he combines, he combines this uh, highly abstract, philosophical, speculative uh, type of work with, uh, with uh, a lot of work. He's, I've read his papers on identity uh, and activism. So thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Vamusa for agreeing to chair this, and I now hand it over to you, and I'm going to mute my mic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, I'm just beginning as a student of uh, uh, philosophy, logic, and also beginning to explore my own culture. Uh, and so I'm yet to reach where you want me to be. <laughs> uh, but thank you for the nice words. Uh, in addition to what you just uh, said, let me just uh, add one or two. The Northeast uh, uh, is a community where we speak more than 300 different languages. And uh, coming to Nagas, uh, we have uh, spread across different states in India and even Myanmar. <clears throat> and uh, we have about 50, 60 different tribes. But when it comes to language, we speak over 100 uh, different dialects. And here is where uh, I want to introduce my friend uh, Sam, Samson. Uh, he comes from one of the communities, Naga communities, the Liang Rong. This is also a conglomer conglomeration of different linguistic groups. I think four. Four. Four, yes. Uh, and his community spreads across uh, three different states, uh, Manipur, Nagaland, and Assam. And uh, having said that, uh, let him speak. And uh, uh, later on, if uh, I have to intervene somewhere, I will. I will. But for now, I give time to Sam. And uh, I think... You know the customary. I, I don't have uh, much idea. So uh, after that, then maybe let's see how we go about. Thank you. I give time to my friend Sam. <clears throat> thank you, Vanessa, for having agreed to chair. At the outset, I want to thank our respected director, who has acknowledged the potential of my work in his uh, brief talk about my work. I appreciate that you have uh, recognized the potential of my work. And I also would like to express my gratitude to all the higher authorities of this STEAM Institute and to all the people who have been working day and night to make the stay of all the fellows very comfortable and very fruitful in this campus, though we stay for very short and my gratitude will remain uh, insufficiently expressed, no matter how beautifully I might word it. Uh, coming to my work, I also would like to thank Professor Razvir, who in fact agreed to chair my session uh, for my introductory presentation month of September last year. Thank you so much, sir. And I have, in fact, interacted with him uh, last year uh, quite frequently when we used to have lunch together there in the mess. But I have been not visiting mess very frequently uh, because of this COVID. Nevertheless, I am very much indebted to Razvir and all the other elders, Professor M.P. Singh, Professor C.K. Razu, because probably I was the only uh, young fellows who associated mostly with the old fellows. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, my work, when I presented last year during my introductory session, I had uh, presented several pictures because 
I'm a kind of a person who get into the academic work primarily uh, based on field work. For me, I usually do not prefer to write anything if it is not field based or if it is not at least reflexive. So I depend on my life experiences or at least based on the field work that I have done. And uh, during my data collection for my PhD thesis in 2012, I visited Manipur and Nagaland. I had in fact planned to visit Assam in 2012 for my data collection, but then due to conflict between the JMA tribe and the masters in Assam, I could not travel in 2012. So still now, though my passion burns for Zelingrong, and though they are settled in three states of Assam, Manipur, and Nagaland, I'm still confined to only Nagaland and Manipur and prominently in Manipur. And even this present work, in fact, I got the inspiration to work on this since the days of my data collection in 2012, when I visited Nagaland in parent district in Jaluki B town. There I went to a school run by Heraka school. Heraka, in fact, is a religious group uh, led by Rani Gajin Liu. So in that school, I found that the metal gate, the metal gate of the school had some religious symbols, the swastika and the Om. So in fact, I was very curious when I saw the Hindu religious symbol on the metal gate of a school run by Heraka religious group. So I, in fact, inquired into these religious symbols and the lady there, Tashile Zilem, she told me that they are not Hindus in the sense of religion, but they have respect for Hinduism. So, and moreover, the school is also, in fact, helped by uh, Kalyan Ashram. So now, uh, besides this, in fact, ever since my childhood, I have been I was born and brought up in Imphal, Imphal, which is in fact a hub of uh, Maitai Hindus, the hub of Hindu religion of Manipur. So we, we found that in the 90s, since the 90s, we found that many of our people who are settled in the valley, the Rongmai people, especially the Rongmai people of this Zeleng Rong, they were in fact very close with the Maitai Hindus socially and sometimes even religiously. But I will come to this point later on when, when I say how the Zelenong people or specifically the Rongmai people in Manipur Valley are very close with the Maitai Hindus in Manipur Valley. I will come to this later. So what I want to, what I've been wanting to say now uh, so far is that the present work in fact got its inspiration since 2012 further compounded during my uh, postdoctoral work when I collected data in 2018. And in fact, before I came here to join on 4th July last year, I had been to many villages along with my friend who happens to be a colleague of Abhishek Yadav in his university. I have been to many villages, even in the hills, and uh, to collect data because I, I was quite apprehensive of uh, the duration of the data collection. So I wanted to collect as much data as possible. So in fact, I in fact started my work here at ISS even before I came here at IAS because to me, this work is very close to my heart and it is a very important topic. And in fact, my PhD guide, JJ Roy Berman told me when I, in fact, approached him to request him to be my guide, and I approached him saying that I would like to work on dams and development. But he says, he told me that you are a Zelengrong and little or no work has been done on Zelengrong so far. You should make Zelengrong your life mission. So ever since then, I have been making Zelengrong my life mission. And that's why I have put heart and soul in this work. And <clears throat> I believe I'll be able to contribute at least to some some thing to my people through my academic work. And now, 
The Zeleno people, the Zeleno people, in fact, uh, are settled in three states of Assam, Manipur, and Nagaland. And uh, they, the lands where they are settled are contiguous because they are, it means they are connected. But they are connected, however, after the independence, they have been trifurcated into three states of Assam, Manipur, and Nagaland, recognized in different scheduled tribe names. And, and they also know each other by different names. Now, to me, the present work here at IA has become very crucial because uh, when I say the Hindu organization, in fact, I'm yet to properly conceptualize when I say Hindu organization, which will be, which will be in my fourth chapter, though I have done some sketchy work on this. When I say Hindu organization, conventionally, we understand the term Hindu in the sense of followers of Hinduism, the religion of Hinduism. But here, it means it connotes very different. And I found this topic very important because when I met those people, the Zelenong people in 2012 and also in 2018, I found that their conceptualization of the term Hindu was drastically different from the conventional conception of the term Hindu. And that further propagated, that, that further propelled my interest in this work. And <clears throat> I must also tell you towards the beginning that uh, I must also tell you my background. Because after my introductory presentation, I met Professor Suzata Patel. In fact, who was very nice, who was very nice to me on that day with her very severe criticism, which I took it very positively. Because she told me that, she told me, in fact, she told me, I could not understand you, Samson, you being the son of a Christian pastor, how you become very critical of the uh, Christian missionaries' work. In fact, she was climbing up the stairs and then she was trying to walk into her room so we could not talk very properly. So in fact, I we our conversation ended with her question. But then that in fact uh, gave me an impetus to think further on the necessity of the personal identity into a research from the point of view of methodology. Because we always talk about subjectivity and objectivity. For me, objectivity is shared subjectivity. So one cannot, in fact, in social science, obtain the kind of objectivity that we look for in uh, natural science. I cannot be too positivist in the sense of eliminating myself from the work I am doing, because here, even in this work that I'm doing here at IIAS, my identity, my social identity, my feelings, my volition, everything is a part of this work. And if anyone points out unreasonable degree of subjectivity, I'm ready to admit. <clears throat> uh, now, why this work is also very important, again, is also because uh, from theoretical point of view, from the theoretical point of view, I have been uh, I came in touch with this social identity theory when I was collecting data for my uh, project when I was working with ISI. When I say ISI, I don't mean the so-called terrorist group. I mean the Indian Social Institute in Delhi. When I was working with ISI, I had gone to Bangalore uh, to collect data. I was working on the experiences of racism experienced by the students from Northeast. So during those days, I got ample time because during the daytime, I go for data collection and then by evening, I was back. Then uh, I got ample time to think on this and I've been thinking on this social identity theory for quite long. However, without much uh, significant advancement. But uh, in 2019, last year, I got one article published Social Identity of Zelenong People of Assam, Manipur, and Nagaland. 
even there i did not make any uh, significant contribution it was just uh, analysis of the identity dynamics of the Zeleno people within the social identity theory. But here, the work I'm doing here, it becomes very important here because I'm advancing this social identity theory because I have found some uh, theoretical gaps in this social identity theory. And I have substantiated this social identity theory with uh, two uh, theoretical concepts, social validation and social regimentation, which I will come further in the subsequent section of this presentation. Now, social identity, <clears throat> why, uh, why it is appropriate to use social identity theory when I work with the Zelenong people is that, as Venusa alluded to it, that the nomenclature Zelenong comprises five, uh, four groups, Zeme, Lengmai, Rongmai, and Inpui. So there is a sustained identity dynamics which has been happening for very long and which I predict by saying that it will continue. The identity dynamics within this Zelenong group will continue and it is not just about the personal identity. It is not just about the personal identity within that becomes significant in the identity discourse of the Zelenong people, but it is also the social identity, which is very crucial in better understanding of the identity dynamics within Zelenong people. Because uh, the complexity of this Zelenong identity dynamics, I will also discuss further. So in social identity, social identity in fact is uh, a part of social psychology, social psychology. Social psychology in fact uh, was dominated by the West and the American psychologists. And social psychology had its heydays during uh, the 1930s, but Unfortunately, social psychology remained predominated by what we usually call the Western psychologists, and then it could not make much further advancement, perhaps due to lack of diversity in the intellectual uh, class in social psychology. So, uh, but in the late 19, uh, in the early 1970s, Henry Tassel, who was a uh, who was a non-American uh, psychologist, someone from outside the uh, American community, in fact, uh, conducted a research with a minimal group. When I say minimal group, it means a very a small group, around 10, 15, 20 members in a group. So in 1971, uh, a Polish social psychologist, Henry Taswell, conducted a research and then the experiment which he conducted in 1971 was used in 1972 in order to theorize on positive social identity. So the social identity theory, in fact, had its conception in 1972, but it was not properly refined. So social identity theory was further refined with the help of Henry Tasfield's students, John C. Turner, who was a British social psychologist. And it was, in fact, in 1978, with the publication of Social Categorization by Henry Tasfield, we found the proper centralization of the principle of social identity and proper categorization of social identity. It was in 1978, with the publication of Social Categorization. In social categorization of Henry Tasfield, he conceptualized social identity, saying that social identity is a part of a person's identity, which is based on his or her knowledge of his membership to a group. So when I say social identity, when I say social identity, it means that 
uh, it is my identity based on my knowledge of the characteristics of the group with which I identify. So here, unlike the personal identity, unlike the personal identity which is uh, prominent in sociology, in social identity, what is prominent here is the characteristics of the group. Here, what happens is also depersonalization, meaning my personal identity, my innate characteristics are not allowed to dominate the characteristics of the group which are used to define my identity. So social identity, in fact, is contextual because there are several groups. There are several groups in a society and by virtue of my religious identity, I might be a Catholic and I might try to be not Baptist. And by virtue of my being a wrong my identity, I might try not to be a cookie or I might try not to be a Yadav. So depending on different groups, depending on different groups and depending on the context where I'm situated, my social identity keeps on acquiring new identities. <clears throat> now in social identity, in fact, social identity, according to Henry, uh, according to Michael Hawk and Devra J. Terry, social identity, in fact, cannot be viewed as a single identity. It is, in fact, a theoretical perspective. It is, uh, in fact, which contains various theoretical concepts. In social identity, we have got uh, what we call social categorization, social identification, and social comparison. In fact, social categorization, social identification, and social comparison need not happen in strict subse uh, subsequential manner. Any of these may happen depending on the context where you are located. Now, of this social categorization, social identification, and social comparison, social categorization, in fact, came ahead in 1978 in the work of Henry Tasfield. By social categorization, he meant the cognitive process in which a person categorizes the people around him or himself, or it is not necessary that in social categorization, we categorize only the people not necessarily that we confine to the human beings. Social categorization can also be the categorization of ideas, can also be categorization of names, can also be categorization of even things, objects. So in social categorization, what we do is we try to find out the shared characteristics of a group into which the elements are to be grouped. We must be very certain of the characteristics. We try to ascertain the characteristics of the group with which we want to, with which we want to use in order to categorize the person or the things or the objects or the ideas. And <clears throat> then we have uh, social identification. Social identification is also a cognitive process in which When you identify, when you identify the group, after you have assigned the characteristics of the group, you identify with the characteristics of the group and then you identify with the group. So this is social identification. And in social identification, what is important is that we try to enhance our self-esteem. We try to enhance our self-esteem because we have a tendency, human beings have a tendency to always positively assess ourselves. We do not have the tendency to negatively view ourselves. We never want to put ourselves in a negative light. We always want to have a positive idea about ourselves. And because of which, when we identify with any group, that group needs to be categorized with qualities which are positive in nature. And it is not necessary that the 
characteristics that we have assigned to the group with which we try to identify are genuine. It may be concocted, it may be the qualities that we desire to have in ourselves, thus we assign to the group with which we want to identify or with which we have identified. And to cut short, let me come to social comparison. Social comparison becomes very important because in order to be very certain about the group with which we have identified, we also have to be very certain about other groups with which we are not identifying. Why should I not identify with other groups while I identify with a specific group? It's also because I have already developed an idea about the other groups. And it is because the characteristics of the other groups are not favorable to, to me, that I'm not able to identify with the other groups. So I compare. So I compare with the other groups. And when I engage in the process of social comparison, I try to, uh, try to uh, get into the principle of meta contrast. In social identity theory, it is called meta principle of meta contrast. Meta contrast means the ratio of the intergroup differences to the intra group differences. It means that when, uh, when I have already identified with particular group, I will try my best to reduce the differences between the members in the group with which I have identified, while at the same time trying to enhance, even concocted,ly the differences between the groups. For instance, my group and other groups. So I must, I must get into a process of enhancing the differences between the groups. My group characteristics should not be shared by the other groups. As long as there are differences in the groups, then my identification with the group with which I identify becomes very meaningful. Because if I do not have any differences, if I do not try to establish any differences between the groups, my identification with the group with which I have identified with all the assigned qualities, with all the qualities which are favorable to me becomes meaningless. <clears throat> so, in general, social identity theory helps us to understand the social environment in a very simple manner. Otherwise, as Amartya, had said, Amartya Sen had said, that we do not have one single identity. Though we, we may claim one single identity, but in that identity, there are multiple layers or sub-identities. There are several identities within the identity that we uh, claim to have. So all these identities, all these identities act out in different contexts. So it is only in various contexts, it is only in certain contexts that certain identities come into play and they become prominent. And it is not only one identity that we live with, and there are different identities and it is contextual. So even social identity theory is also contextual. And it is highly contextual that it is not possible to generalize. The social identity that we acquire based on our interactions with different groups becomes contextual and it cannot be generalized in order to understand our contextual behaviors. The behaviors that we act out in the social environment needs to be understood in different contexts. My behavior within a religious group cannot be understood with my student's identity. My ethnic or ancestral identity cannot be understood if my identity is taken within the larger ethnic or national identity. So it needs to be contextualized. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> to me, when I was reading this social identity theory, as I said, since 2015, 
when I was reading this social identity theory, I found certain gap, which in fact became very crucial, which in fact was not able to answer certain questions which I posed to this theory. For instance, when I say that when I say that I'm a uh, uh, I'm engaging in a process of social identification in order to acquire the social identity. It may be in different contexts that I'm trying to acquire different social identities in a specific community. Even within a specific community, in different contexts, I may have different social identities because the group with which I identify will have different characteristics. So for each characteristic, I might have each respective social identity. So it is also possible, it is also possible that when I identify with a group with a certain characteristic, it may not be accepted by the, the other group members. For instance, I will be reflexive here and get into uh, my own experience. When I was collecting data for my PhD and for my postdoctoral work, I had certain difficulties with the Zelenrong people who were not Christians because I'm a Christian by my religious identity. So because of this religious identity, which I bear in the name of Christianity, I had certain uh, ups and downs when I met those non-Christians, brothers and sisters, because they looked at me suspiciously, because in fact, I did not blame them and I do not and I will never blame them for their suspicious uh, outlook towards me. It is also based on their lived experience that they suspected a Christian brother from the Zelengron community. Though I claim to be Zeling wrong, though I claim to be wrong, my do I speak a wrong my dialect? Do I claim that I come from a wrong my village? My identity as a wrong my was not well accepted. They were not ready to accept my wrong my identity very willingly because of my Christian identity. <clears throat> In fact, I do celebrate my wrong my identity, but then. There were times when my wrong my identity, my attempt to assert my wrong my identity, though not politically, through the social intercourse, it was not well accepted. For instance, there was a youth conference of one of the religious group of our <clears throat> Zelangrom people in my village. I happened to visit that conference um, and then there was a lecture going on by a resource person I stood up and asked a question, and <clears throat> after I had asked the question, one of the resource persons, in fact, very bluntly spoke on the stage about me. He told the he told the audience that there is someone amongst us who is trying to break us, who is not from our group. So I went there as a Rongmai because it was a religious conference of the Rongmai people or the Zelengrong people. I went there as a Zelengrong, as a Rongmai, and I belonged to that village. And the conference was held resentmented on them by the Nagas or the Cookies, depending on the location where they were situated. So this social resentmentation is also very crucial in social identity theory because social identity is not necessarily not necessarily the identity that we enjoy on our own willingly, depending on the favorable characteristics that we tend to identify with a particular group, because certain characteristics of a group may not be favorable to us, so we may not be in a favorable position to identify ourselves with a group. Now, <clears throat> like, uh, coming to the uh, next chapter, the Zelenrong people. Fact, the Zelenrong people, in fact, the no nomenclature Zelenrong was coined in 1947, February 1947, because the Zelenrong people 
the Zeleno people came to know that the British were about to leave India. So they wanted to form themselves into a collective identity so that they can fight for social, economic, and educational purposes. So in 1947, the Jemei, Lengmai, Rongmai, and Inpui people of Assam, Manipur, and Nagaland came together at Imphal in Manipur. And they took the first syllables of the names of Jemei, Lengmai, and Rongmai, and not the Inpui. So, and elders say that the name Zelengrong sounded very nice to their ears, so they coined themselves as Zelengrong. Now, the name uh, Zelengrong, in fact, is not scheduled as scheduled tribe, but the name Zeme, Lengmai, Rongmai, and Inpui are scheduled as scheduled tribes. In fact, they are known by different names in Assam, Manipur, and Nagaland. In Assam, the name Zeme and Rongmai are recognized as scheduled tribes. In Nagaland, they are recognized as Jeleng, in, uh, to include only the Zeme and Lengmai. And in Manipur, in fact, until January 2012, Jeme and Lengmai were recognized as Kachanaga under the scheduled tribe list. And the Rongmai were recognized as Kabui as scheduled tribe in Manipur. But from January 2012, the names Jeme, Lengmai, Rongmai, and Inpui were also included in the list of scheduled tribes without, without deleting the old names Kachanaga and Kabui. Now, why do the Zelenong people come together in February 1947 to collectively form a collective identity? Zelenong is also because they categorize themselves into one single people. When I say one single people, they have narratives, they have oral traditions and oral histories in which all the four groups, Zeme, Lengwe, Romai, and Inpui, all the four groups believe in one ancestor. So in this sense, I would project Zelengrong as an ancest ancestral group rather than an ethnic group. And <clears throat> when I say ancestral group, I mean the, ident the collective identity in which the constituent groups trace one single ancestor. And that ancestor is identified in the oral traditions of the four groups of the Zelenong people. And his name is Muiba. And according to the oral tradition, according to the oral tradition, the Zelenong people, the Zelenong people belong to the larger Naga group, the larger Naga ethnic group. And when one looks at the Zeleno identity, we can uh, compartmentalize the conceptualization of Zeleno identity into different ways. First one is the mythical identity. When I say mythical identity, I mean the presence of the myths in the conceptualization of the Zeleno identity. Because they believed that they were created by a god and a goddess under the command of their supreme god, Tinkao Raguang, or heavenly god. So they believed that they were created by a god and a goddess. And they, when after they were created, the god and goddess were not able to uh, bless them with the bread of life. So they were lifeless after they were created. So the god and goddess asked the god to bless the first human beings, a male and a female, with life, so the God breath in life of breath. So it was only after a breath of life was breath in by the God that the two human beings created by the God and Goddess became the first human being, which are the first parent of the Zelenong people according to their oral tradition. And it is very interesting to note that in almost every tribal group, we have a, a identity narrative based on oral tradition in which the first human beings are always the first ancestor of that specific group. You'll never find, you'll never find that other groups are associated with the group and then other groups are never identified as the descendants of the first ancestor of that particular group. And it is, uh, <clears throat> 
it is mythical also because the origin where these human beings emerge is also still not identified. It is believed that the first two human beings created by God were kept in a cave, were cave in a cave in order to protect them from uh, the attacks by wild animals. So in order to protect them from wild animals, they were kept in the cave and then they were only released after it was thought by the God to be safe for them. So this cave is also uh, considered to be mythical. But we have got a name for this cave and it is called Mahou Taubai. And after the mythical identity, I would like to come to uh, migratory identity. Now, the migratory identity is in fact uh, very debatable because the migratory identity is very de debatable because the origin, the origin of the Zelenong people the origin of the Zelenong people, according to the migratory identity, is not located within India. And according to Dindai Gangmai, who has written uh, a book titled Mahou Taubai, it is in our dialect. He says that uh, the Zelenong people originated from Minhou province of China, which is also known as uh, uh, Yunnan in our Yunnan in Yunnan province. So this migratory identity that traces the origin of the Zelenong people to China, in fact, is not well accepted by the Zelenong people. Nevertheless, it is very crucial because of the reference in this migratory identity to the construction of the Great Wall of China. We have got in the oral tradition that our elders were subjected to uh, forced labor during the construction of the Great Wall of China. And so in order to avoid this forced labor, they dug the earth underneath the Great Wall of China, and then they came out of this pit and escaped themselves from the torturous <clears throat> labor imposed upon them. So now there is a very close connection between the mythical identity and the migratory identity. Because in migratory identity, we have reference to the construction of Great Wall of China, and in the mythical identity, we have a reference to the cave. Now, to my analysis, the Zelenong people, they identify with the Great Wall of China, and then they identify with a cave which is considered mythical. It is because within the normal social intercourse in Zelenong community, the question of decency is very crucial. Every children, every child is not exposed to any explicit sexual uh, connotation. For instance, uh, the idea of sexual reproduction is not very callously discussed, very freely discussed with the children. So the idea of cave or the idea of a pit under the Great Wall of China, to me, it refers to the female uh, private organ. and. And, and according to uh, one of the authors who has written on this origin of the uh, Zelenong people, he says that uh, the cave, the Mahou Taubai cave was covered with a boulder, which was removed by the horn of a mithun. Now to him, the boulder represents the hymen of a woman, and then the horn of a mithun represents the male genital organ. So this is how they try to uh, they try to transmit the knowledge of human reproductive system to their younger generations. And now uh, we have got a constitutional identity. When I say constitutional identity, I mean uh, also the administrative identity, which was used by the British and continue to be used after the independence of India. The Zemi, Lengmai, Rongmai, Inpui, they are now recognized as scheduled tribes. So they are used as a constitutional category and uh, <clears throat> with the use of the constitutional category, they also realize that there are several constitutional benefits they have to receive based on this constitutional identity and because of which the collective identity Zeleng Rong is gradually dying and the respective identity of the four groups are becoming more prominent. So here we have got what we call the principle of meta contrast. They're trying to enhance the differences between these four groups as much as possible, 
as much as possible so that their respective JMA Lingme Romai identity is duly recognized so that they enjoy the constitutional benefits through this constitutional identity. Now, coming to the belief systems of the Zelenong people, the Zelenong people, they believe in the ancestral belief system. The ancestral belief system is called not by any specific name, but it's descriptive in nature, and so they call it Pupau Cha. Pupau Cha means Pupau means ancestors or religion of the ancestors. And this is how they identify or get, uh, this is how they categorize their belief system as Pupau Cha. Now, uh, there are certain uh, groups who have decided to reform their ancestral belief system, which in fact began since the 1920s. The Zelenong people, the Zelenong people had no practice of uh, worshipping in the temple. They did not have any physical structure where they put up the statue or the image of their god or god's goddesses to worship. But it was only under the leadership of Jadonang in 1920s that uh, the places of worship were being constructed so that people can gather and worship. And it had some uh, political objective also because the religious congregation was aimed at politically mobilizing the people so that they can fight against the colonial power. In fact, it continued uh, since the 1990s. There has been gave for very long when it comes to common place of worship, but it began since 1990s again, because in 1991, certain uh, non-state armed groups based in Manipur Valley attacked two of the Rongmai people in Manipur Valley because uh, they were accused of selling <clears throat> wine. So they were attacked and because of which there was a meeting conducted by the leaders of the Zelengrong. And then further, when the meeting was going on, when the meeting was going on and when the discussion was going on in order to, uh, in order, in, in order to uh, protect their identity because they felt threatened when the valley-based underground attacked the non-Christian Zelenong people, they feel their identity felt threatened. And when this was going on in 1994, February, there was again another attack on the non-Christian people in the hills by one of the Naga armed groups. In fact, they were brutally tortured. They were made to forcefully drink the local breed wine because on that day, they were celebrating the Nanu festival, the festival dedicated to the newborn children, newborn infants. So they were drinking the locally brewed wine and then one of the Naga armed groups came and then they were thrashed very badly. And in that incident, one uh, woman also died out of shock. And then, in fact, the story did not end there. In the evening, they were gathered in a ground and then they were met to dance, jump the whole night in the rain by forced by this one of the Naga armed groups. So after this incident, or after this incidents of 1991 and 1994, under the leadership of Professor Gangumai Kamai, who was a former national fellow of our esteemed institute here, under his leadership, he gathered the Zelenong people of Assam, Manipur, and Nagaland in Manipur Valley. And then they vociferously fought for their cultural identity and for the first time again since 1920s, they were able to come together. Religious affairs became uh, inter-villages and even interstates. Otherwise, the religious affairs of the Zelenong people were always confined to the village. Every religious needs of the people were satiated by the village priests and nothing went out of the village. And this that had been the practice also contributed, partly contributed by the head hunting uh, practice, which was going on <clears throat> in the olden days. So the religious affairs of the Zelenong people significantly transformed, unlike the 1920s reformations under the leadership of Zadonang and Gaidin Liu. So under the able leadership of uh, Professor Gangumai Kamai, the Zelenong people were once again reunited and then they reformed their belief systems Certain taboos were uh, removed, certain <clears throat> beliefs were removed because they collectively 
considered some of the beliefs and practices were superstitious and some of the animal sacrifices were also removed but nevertheless nevertheless the essence of the beliefs of the zeranon people remain now <clears throat> now one can understand why there is so much of remorse against the uh, christians amongst the non christians zeranon people and i'll be very i'll be very uh, i'll try as my as much as possible to be contextual and i'll try not to generalize and sp stick only to the zelenon context and say that this is the reason why zelenon christians they have immense remorse immense anger against the zelenon christians and and it is also the reason why the zelenon christians were always kept or always looked with a suspicious mind and when the zelenon non christian people were cherishing their ancestral culture identity everything that is of their identity which form their self which form their personal identity and social identity when this was disturbed The significant size of the tribals of Manipur are also Christians. So now it is in this context, it is in this context that one can uh, better understand the significance of the work of the Hindu organizations, especially the Kalyan Ashram under the guidance of Rastriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the RSS. In fact, Rani Gaidin Liu, when she was alive, she passed away in 1993. When Rani Gadili was alive, uh, she has been associating with Hindu groups since the 1970s. The Vishwa Hindu Parishad, the RSS, the Kalyan Ashram were very closely working with Rani Gadin Liu. And Rani Gadin Liu, uh, since the days of the Nehru in 1947, when Nehru met, when Nehru met her in 1947, since that time, Rani Gadilu has been a very prominent tribal uh, figure in the Indian uh, history. She has been conferred the title Rani by Jawaharlal Nehru and equal respects have been bestowed upon her even by the Hindu organizations. In fact, she attended the second World Hindu Conference in 19, probably 1979 in Allahabad. And according to Tasile Jeleng, According to Tasile Jeleng, uh, Rani Gadilu, when she attended the Second World Hindu Conference in Allahabad in 1979, uh, dipped in the Sangam, the confluence of uh, Ganga Yamuna and Saraswati. So, to me, it is not very quite. Uh, to me, it is not clear whether it was a snan or meaning the ritual deep or just a courtesy deep. But nevertheless, the social behavior of Rani Gadilu in the Second World Con Hindu Conference there in Sangam clearly tells us how she has shared a very cordial relations with the Hindu organizations. And in fact, there are critics against the work of Hindu organizations amongst the Zeranong people. For instance, we have Sohem Lung Dang, my, who was very critical with the work of Kalyan Ashram working amongst the tribal people. But to me, to me, based on my experience, as I have already said towards the beginning, that I don't write anything without experience, without data. I, I am a field-based researcher, and I don't say and, and I don't do or I don't write anything without any. Uh, based, ever since my experience in 2012, 18, and even before I came here, even after. I came here when I went for data collection. I have found that there is a coded relation between the Hindu organizations and the Zelenong people. And it is primarily because of the, uh, the kind of gestures shown by 
the Kalyan Ashram people, and in fact, which they did not receive from their fellow Zelengrong brothers and sisters who are Christians. So this is the reason why we find a uh, very high level of comfort between uh, in the relationship between the Hindu organizations and the Zelenong people, because it has been preceded since the 1970s under the leadership of Zel uh, under the leadership of Rani Gaidin Liu. Of course, Jadonang was the most prominent leader uh, in Zelenong community, and Rani Gaidin Liu was just a mere follower of Jadonang until uh, India got independence, because Jadonang uh, was hanged to death in. Uh, early 1930s by the British. So until then, she was following Jadonang, and Jadonang did not have the privilege to interact with any of the Indian leaders. In fact, Jadonang wanted to meet Mahatma Gandhi, who proposed to visit uh, Assam. And he had, in, he had, Jadonang had, in fact, even composed a song in praise of uh, Gandhi because. He acknowledged Gandhi, he identified with Gandhi as a group of people fighting against the colonial force. So he composed a song in favor of Gandhi, and he had taught dances to Jelenong youths to be showcased uh, during the visit of Gandhi, but then that did not materialize. However, Rani Gandhilu was very fortunate to have uh, met many of the Indian prominent leaders and until her death, until her death in 1993, she was able to meet many of the Indian prime ministers, including uh, beginning from Jawaharlal Nehru till Rajiv Gandhi. He, she managed, she had the privilege to meet all these leaders because she was fighting for uh, Zelengrong homeland within the constitutional framework of the of India, unlike the NNC with which group. Uh, the group with which her group came into conflict, because the NNC was fighting for total, complete uh, sovereignty or the external right of self-determination, while on the other hand, Radin Gadilu was fighting for internal right of self-determination, meaning homeland, because of which these two groups came into conflict. And in fact, when uh, <clears throat> Rani Gadilu, in fact, uh, appealed to appeal to Indian leaders. Rani Gadilu appealed to Indian leaders to send Hindu leaders to the so-called northeast, northeastern part of India because she feared that the religion or the culture for which her leader Jadonang and for which she had fought was in grave danger under the uh, missionary work of the Christian missionaries. So she had, in fact, written to Indian leaders to send Hindu missionaries in order to salvage them, in order to protect them from the onslaught of Christian missionaries. And once there was a plan for a pope to visit uh, even Shillong. So even there, in that occasion, also Rani Gadilu had written a letter to the prime minister seeking the intervention of the prime minister to request the pope not to visit Shillong or at least to tell him to say that proselytization is uh, out of the modern world. Now, <clears throat> it is in this context of fear of the fellow uh, fear of the Christians that they felt terribly left out. They felt uh, helpless because the Zelenon community were very not very strong, and then they have been fighting for very long against the colonial forces and against the Christian missionaries during the colonial days in order to preserve their cultural identity, which they felt was under threat and which, in fact, based on my data collection, I realized that the people still feel threatened by this uh, work of Christian missionaries. And it is in this context that it is in this context that we have to understand why the Zelenong leaders were asking the help of the Hindu leaders and why the work of Hindu organizations become very prominent amongst the Zelenong people. And now, when the Hindu organizations, the RSS, and now especially the Kalyan Ashram, when they work with the Zelenong people, they don't work in isolation with the non-Christians. 
I was in fact, I was in fact shocked. I was in fact very much shocked when I realized that there were many Christians walking with the Kalyan Ashram. I never, I never thought that there will be Christian, tribal Christians, or there will be Zelenong Christians walking uh, with the Kalyan Ashram. We, uh, I will not take the name of the person, but there is one assistant professor. Uh, she, she is a Catholic. She is a Catholic. I met her. She is a Catholic. She is an assistant professor in one central university, and she is very actively involved in the work of the Kalyan Ashram. She had been to Mizoram and many other northeastern states in various programs organized by the Kalyan Ashram, and. She is a very prominent leader there, despite being a Christian. And I asked her, did you face any problem working with the Hindu organizations? Because you being a Christian, I know you since childhood, you are a Christian and you're still a Christian. I know your husband, you, your family is a Christian family. But she said, no, she did not face any problem. In fact, she has been assigned a very important role to work amongst the Zelenong people in Manipur also under the organization of Kalyan Ashram. And it is not only the Zelenon Christians also, but even other groups, the Maitais. The Maitais are also involved in the work of the Kalyan Ashram, which is in fact very prominent among the tribals. The, even the work of the Kalyan Ashram in Manipur also began since 1970s. They work in different fields. They work in the field of education, social development, cultural development, they work in the health issues. Now, it is very important that uh, when they work with, in the context of health, they mobilize the internal resources of the Zelenong people because there are many Zelenong youngsters who are doctors. And we have got one very uh, prominent gynecologist in Manipur. And it was quite interesting to know that her service has been put uh, into uh, the service of the Kalyan Ashram. And another one which is very prominent in the work of the Kalyan Ashram among the Zelenong people is the documentation of the cultural resources, resources of the Zelenong or even other tribal groups. So the Kalyan Ashram, uh, they visit several of the tribal villages and then they interact with the elders, the senior, the old people, and then they document the oral uh, traditions, the folk songs, the folk tales. <clears throat> so these are priceless resources of the tribal people uh, of Assam, uh, of Manipur and Nagaland, where my work is confined. And I, in fact, talk with some of the youths in private because we we have been hearing this idea of uh, Garwapsi in different parts of India. So I asked some of the uh, youths of the Zelenong people, were you ever told, were you ever told by the Kalyan Ashram people not to eat uh, beef or to abstain from non-veg? In fact, uh, I asked this question to the president of the youth wing of one of the religious, prominent religious group of the Zelenong people. He told me that no, they were never told, they were never told not to, to abstain from any non-veg. <clears throat> I, in fact, further asked, do you feel threatened by these Hindu organizations like the way you feel threatened by the Christian missionaries who, who succeeded in uh, uprooting the cultural identity, the cultural elements of the tribal and then convert the tribal people? He expressed no such fear at all. And in fact, I was quite amused that this, such responses came not only from the leaders of the organization, but even from the common people of uh, the Zelenong people who are not Christians. Now, in fact, there is a fear that the Hindu organizations may uh, convert them gradually. But to me, uh, to say that the Hindu organizations may convert the Zelenong people I would sum up saying that this is a far-fetched claim and it is like a prophetic discourse because for me, I invest complete faith in my people, on my people, those who are not Christians, because there are, there are many well-educated people amongst them. 
and who are capable of thinking for themselves, who are capable of uh, sharing uh, or acquiring or developing a vision for the community. And since the 1970s, the presence of since uh, the Hindu organization since the 1970s, if there is not a single instance of uh, a conversion or even Garwapsi or the homecoming, I seriously doubt that it is not, uh, I, I feel that it is not appropriate to, uh, rather, rather it is a doubt cast upon the non-Christian Zelenon people when we say that you will be ultimately converted. Some even say, some fellow Christians even say, told me that, but they will change their lifestyles gradually and then that will ultimately change their religious identity. Even this also, I'm not fully convinced because uh, there is a practice amongst the Zelenon people that when you file any case in a village, you will have to offer certain quantity of locally brewed wine in a pot and that wine will be consumed after uh, the discussion by the elders now we have got and it is compulsory for them to drink but now we have got elders because of health issues some of them do not consume that wine even though they are present in the village court to decide on any issue and there is another practice in which Anyone who commits a crime, who commits a mistake or a grave mistake and uh, has been found guilty will be fined in the form of a fully full grown, fully full grown pig. And even that the entrails and the heads and the limbs will be eaten by the elders who participate in the decision making process. But now we have got elders who are not consuming beef, who are not consuming pork because of health issues. Now, why I am saying this is because the changes in the food habits, the changes in the food habits are witnessed, not because of the uh, social regimentation or the forceful enforcement of the Hindu organizations. Now, to me, it's quite interesting because uh, I have many, since because of my Christian identity, I have got many Christian friends and elders who knew that I am a researcher and who told me about all these things. But unfortunately, I'm not still able to corroborate with the field-based data that I have experienced so far since 2012. And <clears throat> as I have said, as I have said, there are several Christian uh, people in this work involving Hindu organizations and the Zelenong people. Now, some of the things I believe will be uh, shared with you in the subsequent section of the presentation when there is a, a question and answer session. Now, uh, I have come up to the third chapter. Now, the fourth, fifth, sixth, and the seventh, that is the conclusion chapter, in fact, remains, in fact, uh, we can say not properly touched upon. In fact, it is still in the process of conceptualization, though I have given very in a very sketchy manner. And, in, and I'm very glad that uh, the work, the significance of the work is being realized by the esteemed head of the Institute. And I must say that in order to uh, see uh, the successful completion of this work, I need significant time because the remaining chapters are very crucial because the remaining chapters begins with the idea of Hindu, Hindutva, Hinduism. All these concepts need to be very critically analyzed because it is based on this concept of Hindu that the Zelenong, the non-Christian Zelenong people and the Hindu organizations, they categorize themselves into a single group. And then the, the concept Hindu forms a very uh, crucial bridge in order to identify with each other. So without that, my work will not be completely, uh, will not be in a very proper shape and I need significant time. And I, <clears throat> I believe that the authority of the Institute will be in, in, a, uh, in favor of this work, towards the full completion of this work so that I get some more time so that uh, the work 
which I am doing needs to be given a justice because this is not a complete work and I need about a year of work and the year of work means a significant work and this needs to be uh, better. <clears throat> uh, this needs to be uh, reiterated here again and again that I need some more time and without further time given to me, at least a year time, I think the work will remain incomplete and I will not be doing justice to this work because as I've said, I'm a person who is a field-based researcher without any primary data. I don't go ahead with any writing and all my writings in all my published papers you'll find it at least some amount of primary data is included and i must reiterate again and again that uh, to the to the authority of the institute that i need more time at least a year to complete this work because the work i have done so far has been uh, proposed to have seven chapters as i have shown during my presentation in september last year and so far, I have been able to do properly only up to three chapters. And the significant, the crucial aspect of the work, in fact, may be said to begin from the fourth chapter. The fifth chap the fourth chapter is the Hindu organization. Here, I need to conceptualize the idea of Hindu organization. And in the fifth chapter, I have to look into the Hinduness of Zeling Rong. What do I mean when I say the Hinduness of Zelenrong? What is so Hindu about the Zelenrong people? So I need to go into the uh, rich historical materials as well as <clears throat> the primary data which I have collected and which, in fact, uh, I need to uh, further collect even through telephonic conversation in whatever means that is available for me. And then the next chapter will be this. Uh, the social identity, uh, the, the social identity relations of the these uh, two groups. So significant uh, nature of this work remains, in fact, not properly touched. And I need more time. I say again and again, I need more time. And I appeal to the authority to kindly consider my work in view of the kind of work that I'm doing, which I believe is of national importance because it brings in the idea of national integration and it also in fact a kind of a state of exception because in view of the clamor of allegations against or the outcry against the hindu organizations we see a state of exception here we see a very different we see a different uh, picture here in fact a lived experience of the people, a lived experience of even myself, the researcher, which I would like to put in a very uh, beautiful manner, which I like to put in a highly academic manner and not uh, just in this sketchy manner, which I have done so far after this third chapter. So <clears throat> without uh, losing much time, I would like to conclude by saying that the conceptualization of the concept Hindu in order to better understand the topic, the Hindu organization, I need to further conceptualize the idea of Hindu, in fact, which I have started reading the work of Savarkar uh, Hindutva, who is a Hindu. And I have been reading even the critics of the concept of Hindu and the critics of Hindutva and even the court, court uh, supreme or decision on the idea of uh, Hinduism. All these concepts need to be juxtaposed in order to better conceptualize this social identity theory, in order to understand the social identity theory as a result of social intercourse between the career kartas of Kalyan Ashram, the RSS, and the Zelenong people who are not Christians. And very importantly, as I speak again, the significance of the work lies in the element of national integration, which is very much clear in the presence of several Christians in working alongside or working along with the Hindu organizations in Manipur and Nagaland. So uh, with this, I believe that the quantum of the work required further to be completed is fully uh, 
understood by the listeners, by my fellow uh, fellow fellows and the authorities. And I believe that justice will be done to this work by me, even only if I have been given sufficient time for further extension for which I have uh, requested <clears throat> and I believe which will be considered. And I believe my work will be given justice. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. That was a very good presentation. Uh, after listening to him, I can confidently say that he is a good uh, researcher and an upcoming scholar for our Naga people, and in particular, uh, his community, the Liang Rong people. Uh, I, I see that he is uh, not prejudiced by anything as an independent uh, scholar. Coming from a Christian community, I don't see any biasness in him. So there is a good blend of objectivity and subjectivity, which is required for a social scientist. I can see that in him also. And uh, on top of that, he keeps saying that uh, he doesn't say anything blindly, but from his lived experience. And that is very important to begin with. He does that, but he never leaves it there itself but he goes on uh, to the level of abstraction. So there's a good blend of primary and uh, uh, theory uh, 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 interface in his research, which I thought is uh, uh, noteworthy because uh, our Naga generations, uh, only in our recent time, we have started uh, doing this kind of uh, scholarship researchers and what he is doing is going to benefit our community a lot. Now. Uh, the implications of his research uh, is again worth pointing out because he talked about uh, uh, the apprehension of his people and few others. Now, uh, the point is that uh, if you may be knowing the uh, father of our Naga national movement, uh, Pizzo, uh, his initial apprehension is that uh, unless we become uh, uh, independent, uh, we have large religious groups surrounding us and will be submerged either by Hinduism or Muslim Islam or Buddhist from Myanmar or Bangladesh in India. And so we have to protect this cultural identity or religious identity. That is his first apprehension. The second apprehension was text. If they come and impose text uh, like the colonizers, the British, uh, India will take away all our land. So that was the starting point of his movement. And today, uh, what Sam is trying to say is very significant in the sense that, no, uh, 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 this has sent a very important signal that we can coexist without uh, uh, converting one or the other. And I, I think this message can uh, uh, have ripple effect on our perception of uh, threat of others. Second thing is that uh, with rapid globalization or modernization or Christianization I I among the Naga people, uh, we are losing our sense of identity. Uh, and now in the present time, there is a recent trend to go back and search our root, where we have come from. And I, I think uh, in the context of Nagaland, our population uh, of Christianity is so big that we have lost touch uh, uh, with our root. But uh, the kind of research uh, Sam is doing can, uh, can tell us actually what our ancestral beliefs and practices were, what their values were. And so for people like us, uh, researchers, we can benefit so much from his research. And that is what uh, I see the importance or the significance of his research that it will have a longer impact. But uh, today I, uh, he, he got respect from me uh, after listening to him in the sense that uh, he is very much de dedicated to his work and to his people. He's not doing for his stomach and bread, but really for the benefit of his people. And then I see something extraordinary in him. So I wish all the best here or elsewhere that he continue to work for the good of the people and for the Naga community at large. Having said these observations, now I open up this time for uh, comments, questions, 
uh, whatever you have to say. I can give time. I prefer to take one question at a time. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, I, I think uh, we can uh, give indication, pop up uh, your video, give indication, and then let your question come in. I will not interrupt, let him take. Hello. Um, yeah. While uh, while waiting for others' uh, questions, uh, I just uh, barge in to first of all congratulate Samson on this very authentic and original work that supports his not only his social identity but is um, towards is will be a major contribution towards creating this. Uh, you know, ethnic, cultural, um, personal, and religious uh, identities in a in a in a very substantial manner. Let's wait. She is not done with her. I think the uh, comment. Yeah, madam, please come, madam Alka. Yeah, I was uh, I was just like complimenting him for this very authentic research and right in the beginning, you know, when he talked about, the, talked about how the social identity theory, which he originally originally he like you know he based his research on this, and then he found the loopholes in that, uh, and then he explained uh, that portion was uh, you know very interesting like how he's uh, from a very uh, rooted uh, vantage point he is trying to uh, like you know um, integrate uh, in uh, like he's trying to create his own uh, formulas to understand this special vantage point on which he is uh, placed besides that uh, like mm, uh, his research uh, importance of his research has been commented upon by venusa um, personally i would like to ask him uh, this question that, you know, there are these christian uh, he he belongs to a, the Christian Jalilong uh, uh, community, as I understood. Uh, my question is like, you know, they, uh, why he, uh, though he belongs to the Christian minorities, um, and the Kalyan Ashram as Hindu missionaries, they come and uh, they they help these uh, not only the Christian but also land. <laughs> Oh, why do you have to uh, you have to be Christian uh, missionaries and not the Hindu uh, missionaries? And this is one. Just a moment. Just a moment. Another. Again, please uh, repeat. Uh, we we lost you somewhere. Okay. Okay. Um, now it's very clear. Okay. No, I was I was saying that you know he himself belongs to this Jalilong Christian community, and he said that there is uh, there is non-Christian communities and Hindu missionaries are uh, supporting the entire range of the communities of the land. My question is like, uh, on what grounds does he feel that these Hindu missionaries do not have an agenda? Although he did mention that, you know, he has been talking to the student leaders and they uh, they they are not asked to uh, suppress anything like like eating meat or for that matter, you know, their own. They are rather recording the uh, tribal songs and the tri documentation of the culture. And all. So these are the works that Hindu Hindu missionaries are doing. But how do you make sure that the Hindu missionaries do not have a long term agenda? So what are the other things that you feel are uh, kind? If you can... Before I give to Sam, <clears throat> is there any related question? Related question. 
Okay, same. Yeah. I am further elated to receive this question, madam, because this question, I believe, will continue haunting me. <laughs> in fact, uh, last year, when I was having my lunch there in our mess, here in our institute's mess, there were some uh, this, uh, visiting fellows. I happened to sit down uh, with them. And then one of the visiting fellows, I in fact, I shared with the group my work with them. And then a uh, similar question was posed on me. And in fact, I knew that this question will remain very important for me. And though I may not be able to answer very satisfactorily, but to me, the best way to answer this question to whosoever I meet or whoever asks me this question is that I have faith in my people. I have faith in my people <laughs> because uh, I respect them and I feel that they are able to think for themselves. And this is, this is, uh, this is more of a uh, cognitive process. When I say I have faith in my people, when I say that they are able to think for themselves, this is more of a cognitive answer. Now, uh, to give you a practical answer is that, as I have said, that Rani Gaidin Liu herself, since the 1970s, have been associating with Hindu Vishwa Parishad, RSS, and Kalyan Ashram. And uh, also, we I must also bring here the fact that uh, the Maitai people with whom the Zelenong people in Manipur Valley are closely associated are predominantly Hindus. Hindus in the sense of religious identity. They have got ISKCON, they have got uh, Hanuman temple, they have got various Hindu uh, temples dedicated to uh, Hindu deities. So we have been in an associational relationship with the Maitai Hindus for uh, more than a century, over centuries, more than centuries. So despite that, despite that, I have never seen had had the Hindu missionaries in the 19th century who came to convert the Maitais, had they had a desire, and this desire continued until now, probably just like the Christian missionaries converted the Zelenong people, many would have been converted to Hindus, the Hindu religious identity. But I have not seen these, and I'm I'm not saying, I'm not saying, and let, let me not be, uh, let me not be very prophetic again here, as I have said earlier. <laughs> let me not be prophetic because uh, the kind of research that I have done, in fact, is, as I have said, is very contextual. It's very contextual and I cannot use this data or I cannot use my research for generalization. And I'm, I have not adopted a positivist approach uh, so that I can use a finding for generalization. But as far as my lived experience is concerned, and as far as the primary data that I have generated based on my uh, direct interaction with the people and the observation I have made, I see not an iota of conversion into Hinduism by the non-Christian Zelenong people. Rather, they are very vociferous about the preservation of their cultural identity. In fact, in fact, I must tell you here that uh, the non-Christian Zelenong people are even, uh, they have got different religious groups, even within them, they have a conflict and then they are not in very good terms with each other because each identify with their own religious identity with enhanced positive qualities of their own group while ascribing negative identities to other groups. So here I come again, the principle of meta contrast. Even within these Romai people, to be very specific, within the Romai people, we have got different religious groups again. And each religious group, they feel that their religious group or their belief system is uh, the primordial and the other three, uh, the other groups are not primordial, they are man-made. So in this context, when a group is, or an individual within a group is strongly identifying with their own ancestral identity, ancestral religious group, I see a doubt of 
uh, relinquishing their ancestral identity for the sake of any other religion which is which they do not conceptualize within their social identity thank you samson thank you madam Well, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, you are right when you say that you're focusing on data. It's a good thing to focus on data. But uh, why are you uh, so defensive about generalization? Because you are using generalizations. When you talk of your theory of social identity, you are using generalizations made by somebody else. So why don't you make your own generalizations? And why be so defensive? Why be so afraid about it? This is just something people say, oh, don't make generalizations. Don't listen to them. You make your generalization. <laughs> any, any, any related question? Okay, that's your methodological sir, response. Um, so as usual, I'm very uh, glad that you're very direct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and in fact, in fact, in academics, in academics, no matter how much you struggle, you should always be ready for the severest criticism. And I'm very glad that, sir, you are one of them who provide this very critical criticism. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, sir, this question of subjectivity and objective, I mean, the question of generalization, the question of generalization, I do not... I, I I have sounded very defensive of my contention of not uh, getting into the process of generalization. Uh, I believe I need to reconsider into that. I need, I need to con uh, think about it further. But what, as far as my understanding is concerned, what I'm trying to do, sir, is I want to contextualize only with the general identity. Only within the Zelenkov identity, of Manipur and Nagan. So there are also Zelenkov in Assam. I'm not. I'm not saying anything about the Zelenkov people of Assam. I'm saying only about the Zelenkov people of Nagan and Manipur. So to this, I may not be in a right. I may not be in a right position to say that. Uh, I mean, to have any generalizations. Make generalization, then all those uh, Westerners who are theorizing about it and whose theories you are using, you are in a better position to do so. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for your comment. I will, as this is not a complete, uh, not in a completed stage, I'll further think about it, sir. And thank you so much, sir, for your comment. I can see, uh, Madam. Uh... Nana's uh, hand uh, being raised, but now she's not visible. But uh, we can hear you. So, Madam, uh, you can uh, help uh, me comment or question. Madam, uh, Madam, can you hear me? I think that we have a network problem. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you, we can. Well, congrats, first of all, congratulations, Samson, for a wonderful directive that you have given. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, now. Yes. Yeah. yes. I agree with the and Make the distinction between generalization, generalization and universalization. <laughs> okay. that, is, that is just one thing. And second, oh. I just want to ask you a clarificatory question. Uh. That are there are there any experimental studies regarding the characteristics of the group sharing the social identity? Experimental studies, social science in social science experiments. Are there any studies? 
identity characteristics of social identity express yes okay yeah. ma'am uh, in in i'll come to this in fact uh, the first experiment on uh, social identity was Uh, in fact, when the first uh, laboratory based laboratory based was conducted by Henry Tasfell in 1971, in fact, it was theorized on a positive motive of social identity. So it was an experimental experimental based research in 1971. And in fact, the concept, the term social identity, though was not specifically used in 1971, it was in 1970, it was in 1978 that the term uh, social identity was used. So the first paper, work, it has, uh, <clears throat> The social categorization article, which came out in 1972, was based on uh, the characteristics of the group formed by individuals based on certain contexts, meaning that the group members were put into different contexts, initially not knowing each other. Later, the other group was formed in such a way that the nature of the composition of the groups were uh, let known to the individuals who were participating in uh, this is coming to generalization uh, <laughs> it's very difficult for me to uh, based on belief also as I feel as I feel that it for instance the social norms the kind of social well may be said to be universalization. But I'm sorry, I'm not in a position to answer properly this generalization and universalization. Answer my question. You want to Yes, madam, can you, uh, uh, you want to help uh, Sam with this clarification of generalization and universalization? Do you see, have any this, people? See, the, this generali generalization, generally what happens is that in statistics, you are studying a sample and on, on the basis of that, whether you can generalize or not, that depends on the representativeness of the sample. So exactly. here, you, here you are not drawing any sample you are just collecting your data. Mostly it is narratives. So, I mean, what you have been saying is that you are restricting, restricting yourself to a particular context. So, general beta can generalize on the basis of that context is a question. What right. Dr. Raju was suggesting that you are using a social theory, so you can always generalize. That's what, that's what Dr. Raju's point was. So you have to distinguish, distinguish between generalization based on data collected from a sample and the narratives. Whether from narratives you can generalize is a different question. Right. That it was different parameters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Am I right, Raju? <laughs> In fact, uh, yeah. generalization okay. Thank you. other other groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I once I thought I saw Professor uh, Charma's uh, hand uh, going up or something like that. Uh, 
You have question for? Uh, In fact, uh, yes. Uh, I I was listening to Samson very carefully. I think I come to the conclusion that he is he has raised many theoretical questions. And uh, the study would be, in fact, of uh, great relevance if uh, he is able to link different factors giving rise to his social or cultural group. I believe that he brought in a number of factors, not only social, religious factors which have contributed or which may contribute to the rise of a cultural or social group. But at the same time, I think uh, when he was referring to certain belief systems, for example, the ancestral uh, pride in, in a certain group, I am reminding, uh, reminded of even the northern uh, parts, there are uh, several groups, uh, caste groups also, which do subscribe to the same belief systems. And ancestral pride, in fact, has been responsible for the constitution of their uh, of their uh, group. For example, in, in, in various caste groups like Kshatriya Mahasava, like Jat Mahasava, like uh, many other uh, Mahasavas or organizations have come into existence uh, on various uh, uh, grounds, including uh, religious and also the ancestral uh, kind of a, of a history. So therefore, can there be some kind of a comparison between the uh, social uh, religious organizations of the East, uh, particularly with, uh, the example which he is carrying, and also whether it, the belief systems can be can be communalized uh, in that sense. This is a one. Number two, I think his study would be uh, would be of quite importance, particularly in removing certain uh, misperceptions and misconceptions that no social organization can work without a long-term agenda. I don't think the social organizations have always a long-term agenda. They may be having the agenda for bringing about a change in the economic conditions, in the ecosystem of a particular group. And I think if that is the idea behind, and uh, Sanchan has, at least till now, has put together some kind of a ground data and ground data, the original data, can be a better proof about the working and the agendas of the organizations. No other uh, system has been evolved perhaps so far, which can remove these uh, kind of uh, uh, the uh, preconceived ideas. So therefore, the third thing which I would like to say and tell Samson is that uh, basically it should be aiming at whether the group which is studying is also trying to bring about a change in this in this economic and social uh, kind of conditions of that group, or it is merely uh, merely surrounding its activities towards maintaining some kind of a uh, separate social identity. Thank you. Yes, sir, coming to the first point, uh, of course. It is very important for me that I take into consideration of the other social settings or the other social groups where similar works are being done. And uh, as far as today's presentation is concerned, it is the introductory chapter, then the social identity theory, and then the Zelenrong uh, people, meaning understanding the Zelenrong. So, so uh, if I were to answer your question very satisfactorily, I must uh, come to the fourth chapter, which in fact is in a very sketchy manner. And as I have uh, alluded before that uh, the Kalyan Ashram people, the organization, they are working very actively even amongst the Khasi, Jenta, Garo, and the Boros of Assam, uh, Meghalaya, and various other states even in Arunachal, they are working with different tribal groups, even within Manipur, not only the Zelenrong people, but uh, the nature of the work is such that I'm confining only to the Zelenrong people because I'll, I might not be in a position to manage the voluminous data if I were to see the all other places. However, it does not mean that I will 
not take into account of the other groups. I have to and I need to. In fact, it was even suggested by our respected director during my uh, earlier that uh, when I discussed my work with him also and when he introduced me, when I initially came in July last year that uh, I also need to look into the work of the Hindu organizations working in different parts of the world, not only in India. So all these works, in fact, remain uh, <laughs> remain yet to be done. And, and it is for this reason that I need some more time sir, to do this work. And <clears throat> second. So, so what uh, the second one, sir? Yes. I'll come closer. Uh, my my uh, I have a curiosity question. Okay, okay. Yes. Um, so I want to ask Samson whether you have talked about the origin myths. In your Zilong congregation, you have included so many communities, and every community has its own origin myths, its own rituals its own cultural past, its own performances, its own subsistence pattern. My question is, do they have any shared cultural past among themselves? If they have one, then it is a social organization. If they do not have one, it looks, this is a political organization, zero. Am I right? <clears throat> So, uh, in fact, the Jemei, Lengmai, Rongmai, and Inpui, these four groups, they still continue to share common oral tradition of common origin. They believe that they had one common ancestor. And that common ancestor, in fact, is also identified with a particular name, Muiba. So, <clears throat> In fact, the identity narratives rooted in oral traditions in which they are located within the Naga identity is quite complex, is very complex, because every Naga groups tend to have their own specific identity narrative again, despite sharing a common identity narrative of the Nagas. Similarly, even within the Zelengrong, the four groups Though they have, and though they still cherish a belief in common ancestor, who they believe was settled in one particular place called in Makui Longdi in Manipur, they, in fact, after several centuries of migration from Makui Longdi, when they have acquired separate names, when they were all together, settled in Makuilongdi, it is not known by what name they identified themselves because usually amongst our tribal people here in the northeastern parts, especially amongst the Nagas, we usually do not have a name for our own people. We yes. do not have a name for our own people. We used to say ourselves. We used to just identify with the similar groups and say ourselves. And that is not a name. However, however, after having settled for <clears throat> very long time at a place called Makui Longdi, there were in, uh, narratives vary here. One of the narratives says that the, the ancestor, the common ancestor at Makui Longdi, they, he had three sons. And according to the narrative, Two of the sons migrated and the, the other son remained along with his father. And one of the groups that migrated from Makui Longdi went towards the valley and they came to be known as Jemei, which is derived from Zangme or valley. And one of the groups migrated towards the southern side and thus they came to be known as Rong Mai or Southerner to which I belong. 
and the group that stayed behind with the father at Makuilungdi came to be known as Liang Mai. Liang Mai, the name no, Liang Mai has got two theories attached to it on its origin, meaning the name Liang Mai is also because the people who stayed behind at Makuilongdi along with his father and their descendants, they had a pattern of settlement in pockets. So the pattern of settlement in pockets was called Ki Liang in Liang Mai dialect. So as they settled in Ki Liang pattern, they came to be known as Liang Mai. And the other theory is that they came to be those ancestors and descendants who continue to stay at Makuilongdi came to be known as Liang Mai because they are to the north of these two groups who migrated. So Liang means north or Liang Mai means people of okay, north. Dr. Or... Sim Seng, I understand your, your answer is very convincing and it has aroused another curiosity in my mind. Do they have a common shared mythical past with other Nagas also? Yes, sir. They oh, have. Yes. Oh. Yes, yes. Just in brief. Yes, sir. Amongst the Nagas, they believe that they were uh, commonly settled at a place called Makhel, which is also now identified in Manipur. They believe that they all migrated from a particular place called Maho Taubai. And Maho Taubai remains a mythical place. So they believe that they migrated and settled at different places and ultimately came at a place called Makhel, which in fact is identified physically in Manipur now. And the Nagas further migrated from Makhel. So the Nagas also share a belief in common ancestor and a common place of settlement. Thank, we you, see... thank you, thank you, Samson. Very nice, excellent answer. <laughs> okay, I, I, I think I have a question from my study, study roommate. Uh, Subo, can you please uh, turn on your mic and direct your question to Sam? Subo, are you there? Subo. Subramaniam, sir? If Sub, uh, Subo is taking time, can I come in? Please, please. This is Hiten Patel. <laughs> First of all, uh, I must congratulate you and I must express my admiration for you because that this presentation makes me proud and very happy for two reasons. One is that uh, to me, this kind of a presentation makes, uh, to me, it's a tribute to Indianness. There are various ways of looking at Indianness. And I believe that uh, social scientists have a mischievous role in, in, in under, I mean, overplaying some kind of things about Northeast. And we keep falling back on the same kind of excuses that is very diverse, it's very complicated, and so on and so forth. And we never really bother to try to think of the historical associations this region has with what is called mainland India. And I'm, I'm particularly delighted to come across to, you're not a history, history student, but I was looking for, for, for one kind of explanation that why uh, Jadanang, who was uh, uh, hanged by the British, who wrote a song on Gandhi, and he was a kind of freedom fighter there, and he is not known to us. And why Rani Gadilyu, who had been there in, in, in Allahabad. I mean, you mentioned that, and he had all kinds of connections, but still that Rani is not seen as a freedom fighter. And this, I keep asking these questions to people. And I find that most of us do not bother to associate ourselves with the scholarship that is emanating from the Northeast. And in that connection, your work is an exceptional work. I do not know whether you will get time for, uh, for working on it or not. But I, in my view, uh, this kind of scholarship is true scholarship, which actually think about the community, think about the various permutations and combinations 
in the identity formation, you are very right in, in saying uh, that uh, it is context, context determined and any kind of identity fixation is one kind of thing which makes Nagas always suspicious for, for, for others. So your kind of scholarship is is breaking the breaking the kind of I mean the uh, this was this is the breaking the barriers. In my opinion, you're saying that uh, this this Hindu organization working in that area is not trying to convert these people is, is a remarkable conclusion you are offering because your experiences and your kind of evidences suggest that. There are people, there are people who are not interested in the way Christian missionaries had been interested. They are the people who understand the development issues. They understand the people and even bringing Christians into their fold. And they, they are working, you are referring to a, a, a assistant professor, a Christian assistant professor. So these kind of works are actually welcome to us. Mm -hmm. And this kind, of, this kind of works actually give us hope about the Northeast. And our prime minister is always referring to think about, uh, I mean, uh, look towards East. And obviously, these kind of works are going to help us to, to understand Northeast better. Forget about the diverseness and all that. These kind of works are there to actually give us hope. And I believe that I'm, I'm sure that your work is going to be an outstanding work, outstanding work, whether you work here or somewhere else, this work is going to be an outstanding work. And with all conviction, I can say that this is an opportunity for IIAS to take, I mean, the credit for this kind of work here or leave it for some other organization to, to, for, for, for this credit. I, I, I congratulate you and I believe that this kind of work is, is, is what makes us very proud. And uh, I don't know what will happen to you and what will happen to your project. But I, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, I mean, I, I had so many things in my mind, but uh, at, as of now, I, I would just give you the, uh, the, 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 my support to your, your work and this kind of honest work is what is needed. Social scientists have not actually done this kind of work. They always fall back on theories. They always fall back on some kind of some kind of jargons and all that, they never really touch upon those issues which are related to ground realities. And I, I believe that uh, the, this, this work is going to be, uh, going to be extraordinarily important. I, I, I must say that uh, on Northeast, I have listened so many uh, lectures and this is the work which I consider most honest and most sincere work. I'm not raising any questions. We will have, I hope I will have more opportunities to raise questions, critical questions. But at this moment, I just get, I, I wish you all the best for your work. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my roommate, uh, Sadimed is back. Uh, Subo, you can. Uh, yeah, thank you. Come you. Sorry, I was disconnected. Yeah, you I can agree. hear me. Yes, 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 sir. Can. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I want to reiterate what Hitendraji said, which is that it's ex exceptionally important work. And uh, I really wish it is completed and not left half done. Mm -hmm. And I hope uh, we create atmosphere and opportunity for him to finish this. Uh, especially, I'm interested in the fifth chapter that he talked about, where he talked about the relationship between Hinduism and the religion of the people he is talking about. But having said that, I have strong disagreements which I want to uh, make known. Two sets. Uh, one is a suggestion uh, which relates to the role of state in the identity formation. Uh, you know, you mentioned the methodological migratory and the constitutional identities which people have developed. But I think more than the constitutional identity of being a scheduled tribe and then the attendant uh, uh, whatever blessings or curses, uh, I think it's very important to look at the role of the state in identity for me. Uh, the existence of competing states 
whether Burmese state or Chinese state and Indian state, or at some point of time. Your like voice it. is breaking. Uh, audio is audible. breaking. Am I audible now? Partly, part, yes. Yes, yes, yes. We okay. Can now. I'm basically arguing that you have to look at the role of the state. Huh? When you had the British state entering the Northeast, and lot of the tribal areas, they were very keen to uh, help, like our director pointed out, the Christian missionaries to enter, even though it was against the stated state policy. Similarly, even the Congress government, when it started, uh, you know, active measures in the Northeast, whether it is in Arunachal or it is or in the other states, it was very consciously promoting a Hindu outfit, different kinds of Hindu outfits to make entry into the North. So the state patronage and the state uh, pressure and competing state pressures uh, and also neighboring states, I think is an important issue mm -hmm. in the identity formation. Uh, uh, related to it, I think is a historical issue of uh, I did not get any idea of the subsistence pattern uh, of these tribes. Uh, has there been like in Arunachal and other states, uh, state preferred transition from uh, slash and burn, jhum cultivation and hunting gathering to terrace farming and other things? This I have not, uh, uh, not get from your description. If so, what role does this change in subsistence pattern have in the religious identity formation? This, I think, is very, because all these religious identities are very crucially hinged upon the subsistence uh, uh, pattern which people practice. Uh, these are the two uh, suggestions which I would like you to look up whenever you complete your work. Uh, the disagreement uh, is over this issue of uh, the faith that you have that there will not be the Lord be conversion. <laughs> I think uh, this the entire history of our country yeah, for the last two thousand years has been a history of how uh, different communities with their own. Uh, local religious practices were absorbed into a larger religious system. It could be Islam, it could be Hinduism, it could be Christian. There is an overwhelming drive of the so-called universal religions to hegemonize the local religious practices, and that is a historical process. Now, you cannot, uh, you know, prophecy and say, no, no, this will not happen. You have to how it happens. And what is the uh, dignity and respect and accommodation that happens in this process rather than how one sided it can become? That's the only uh, problem that we face. You know, that in many incorporations, they become one sided. In some incorporations, it can be much more dialogical, much more uh, accommodative, and inclusive. We need to look at this aspect rather than to you know, just take a black and white conversion, not conversion. But I really hope that you get the time and the resources to complete this work, the field work required to do it, and especially I'm interested in the fifth chapter that you made. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, your comments, sir. Before you respond, uh, Professor Dash Pandey has uh, some question. And then I saw Prasanjit also giving me indication. So can your question, uh, and then, uh, yes, <laughs> Abhishek, three of you, can you please uh, pour in with your questions, one after the other, Professor Desh Pandey and Prasanjit and uh, Abhishek, and you can uh, uh, respond to them together because I think we're running out of time. Yes, sir. <laughs> am, I, am I audible? Yes, yes sir. sir. OK. See, I am. Uh, con I congratulate you uh, for this excellent presentation. I have heard about uh, your project and also about uh, the theme that you are uh, 
<laughs> doing under your project. Uh, but I was not sure how uh, serious the work is. But today I have, re have uh, understood the depth of your project and also the vast canvas that you are going to cover. So I congratulate you for that. Second thing is that uh, I am particularly happy about you about one thing. You mentioned Gangu Mai, uh, who was a fellow here long ago, and I was there at that. Uh, there at that time, uh, the, I think it was 2009, um, yeah, 2009 or 10. And uh, he, we were good friends. So thank you for uh, uh, reminding me of uh, my, my old friend. Uh, the third thing is uh, uh, about re religious conversion. And uh, uh, I think there were some remarks made in connection with religious conversion. And then uh, it was suggested, or generally we think to suggest that all conversions are of the same type or of the same level, uh, which is not the case. And uh, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not uh, going to uh, defend uh, any particular kind of thing, but there is a marked difference between Islamic conversion, the Christian conversions, and Hindu, Hindu conversions. Hindu conversions are never uh, like the Islamic or the Christian conversion. And that is the that is the one important way to understand this Kalyan, uh, this Adivasi Kalyan Ashram, uh, you know, activities. That is one thing. So the so therefore to think about Hindu agenda and this agenda and that agenda is totally irrelevant mm -hmm. in the context of your project. Now I agree also with uh, Hitendra Patel that as far as the East is concerned, uh, as far as the North East is concerned, uh, the states, the, even the social science and the humanities activities are largely neglected. And therefore, a project like yours is going to be a major step in the in the total academic, uh, you know, or the research uh, activity. Uh, you know, environment as far as the Northeast is concerned. So that is another important aspect of your thesis, uh, of your project. And since everybody is saying that uh, your project is so good and that it requires uh, time, I, I I also join everyone in extending <laughs> my wishes that you, you must uh, get uh, uh, you know, you must, guys say it very explicitly, you must get the extension for another year for this project because there have been precedences like this. So it has to be done, whatever the case may be. So uh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I request Sanjit and Chet to keep your question very brief. <laughs> Sanjit, first you come in. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I, am I audible now? Yes, yes. Hello? Yes, okay. we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so my feedback is mostly coming from the point of view of an ethnographer myself, you know, and you, huh. and you gladly spoke so much about fieldwork and, you know, thank you so much for that. Uh, my other uh, points of view, of course, remain the same. The seniors have said so much about, I mean, it's a very important work. Uh, a, a, a couple of things. Uh, 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 my uh, my uh, my reflection would be one would be uh, as an ethnographer, I think uh, uh, um, to qualify certain statements like uh, you know uh, like uh, a particular organization is not uh, into conversion or a particular organization is into conversion. I think uh, it would take lots of rigor, uh, uh, you know, and lots of rigorous data to actually uh, 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 qualify that statement. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's because it's uh, it's an important statement to make, and and one can get like. Sir, sir, get, can I intervene? Uh, the, yeah. the system analyst is saying that uh, the meeting is going to end in five minutes. Can it be extended, please? This is very important. <laughs> yes. discussion. Can it be extended? Can it be extended? Because uh, this is the there is a message that meeting will end in two, three minutes or five minutes. It's a very important discussion going on. So, can it another session can be offered, sir? I think uh, I think uh, we must extend the meeting. Yeah. And uh, if you can hear me, if you can hear me, kindly extend the meeting. 
मैं एक ही चीज कहना चाह रहा हूँ फॉर वन मिनट ओनली दैट कल इंडिपेंडेंस डे जो हमारा स्वतंत्रता पर्व है वो हम मनाने जा रहे हैं एट नाइन ए एम विथ सोशल डिस्टेंसिंग इन द फ्रंट लॉन्स सो ऑल द फेलोज आर कॉर्डियली इन्वाइटेड टू प्लीज कम इफ वेल इफ दे फील लाइक कमिंग इफ दे आर एबल टू मेक इट बाई नाइन ए एम ऑन अ सैटरडे दैट्स माई पर्सनल इन्विटेशन एंड रिक्वेस्ट टू ऑल ऑफ यू uh because i think that uh, uh uh not only because of the importance of independence day and so forth but for me it would be uh, incomplete if uh, if our fellows did not uh, uh make it convenient to come so i i extend my cordial invitation to you and kindly extend the meeting please thank you thank you okay looks like we uh, can take in more questions so Yes, yes yes yeah 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 okay yes. yeah yeah thank you thank you so much okay so, uh, yeah, yeah yeah no so, please wait, uh, wait for wait for a minute because uh, many others have not joined just wait for one minute because he is raising okay. a good question all right, okay. right i realize we have time now <laughs> okay sure sure yeah. yes sorry yeah yeah so i'll so i'll just continue yeah Uh, so i i think that you know it will be uh, uh, it, it will be methodologically uh, dif difficult to to qualify a statement which you know uh, which says something like a particular organization is into is uh, is is into conversion whether it whether it wants to convert uh, people or whether it doesn't want to convert people right as an ethnographer and uh, uh, i think uh, only uh, uh, vignettes from from the field uh, won't be enough to to show that you know uh, that is my uh, feedback i think uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, that that it would need more rigor to actually like you know qualify such an important statement uh, 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 my second uh, thing is uh, feedback is that you know when we work with identities right when we uh, work with identities as, as ethnographers an identity is, is such a it's it's such a um, Uh, it's such a it's, it's such a rhizomic it's such a uh, complex complicated topic to work with right so we don't know where personal identity stops where social identity begins where cultural identity comes in where state where identity you know it's it's such a mismatch of so many things right uh, uh, you know so 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 working with identities is so what and who are like my personal identities is actually so many things taken together right and it becomes problematic uh, uh, i have read a couple of works on khasi identity for example you know so 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 the religious identity being a catholic right uh, it's 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 it doesn't really weaken the uh, tribal identity right so being a khasi uh, as a, as an identity is as strong as being a catholic identity right and in fact many a times they complement each other so uh, so so I, i i would be very careful to work with identities uh, you know uh, I, i mean of course you are the expert in, in your area i mean that is something else but as a concept uh, working with identities i find it very uh, <laughs> difficult to work with so so i would be careful with that so these are the two uh, feed, uh, feedbacks that i have uh, i ho i hope uh, it's helpful and again thank you so much for for the presentation it, 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 it was really something thank you for your comments and prasajit i will definitely uh, look into that true here very true that it's very complex to work on the identity issue because identity is something uh, that always keeps on changing so because of this dynamic factor it is very difficult in fact to conceptualize even personal one's personal identity because one's personal identity also will depend on several contexts in which one is located so and no man is in an island so in that context is very difficult but definitely i will look into the comments that you have uh, provided and thank you so much okay thank you others you take other questions also Uh, do you want to get back to uh, may I speak please uh just hold on uh yeah. he is yet to get back to earlier questions so i'm just saying where he wants to get the back first now because we have time we'll give you uh, oh okay okay yeah we have time now I forgot the question <laughs> uh, about stead importantly Oh, regarding uh, 
the state factor in the identity it's dynamics. Crucial. Yeah, the state factor in the identity dynamics. In fact, uh, I have been uh, examining this for quite long, though I did not very properly put into this present work the state factor in the identity dynamics. In fact, it is very crucial because state also plays a very important role in the conceptualization of the group identity. The fact that the various groups of the Zelen people uh, were being scheduled into different names also has a very significant bearing upon the social identity of the individuals of each of these four groups. Now, once the state recognized the <laughs> Zeme, Lema, Rongmai in Ubui separately as Shadow tribes. In fact, this has generated a significant quantum of uh, storm within the collective Zelenrong identity. So there is a tendency amongst the constituent four groups of the Zelenrong to separately identify with these separately scheduled four groups, and because of which the collective identity resulting from the shared origin narrative is all being disturbed at present. So this, in fact, needs to be taken into account. Uh, Abhishek, uh, and after that, uh, Suman, you can come in. Press Abhishek and then Suman. Maybe after okay, that, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> so three of you, one after the other. Uh, आवाज तो मेरी आ रही है ना क्योंकि हम एक ही कमरे से बोल रहे हैं तो जी जी आवाज आ सबसे पहले तो मैं अपने दोस्त और हमारे फेलो डॉक्टर सैमसन को उनके फर्स्ट प्रेजेंटेशन पर बधाई देता हूं कि उन्होंने इतना बढ़िया तरीके से इसको प्रेजेंट किया एक्चुअली नॉर्थ ईस्ट को लेके सो कॉल्ड मेन लैंड के इंटेलिजेंसिया में बहुत सारे भ्रम हैं जो लोग सो कॉल्ड मेन लैंड में हैं वो या तो नॉर्थ ईस्ट को उन्होंने या तो कभी किसी घूमने के उद्देश्य से गए या फिर किताबों में पढ़ा वो उसको देखते भी हैं तो यहीं की पर्सपेक्टिव से देखते हैं नॉर्थ ईस्ट को जबकि वहां का समाज Uh, मैं मैं हैरान होता हूं कि मैं जब किसी को मिसमी कहता हूं uh, लोग कहते हैं कि मिसमी ट्राइब के बारे में बात हो रही है ये शायद ही लोग जानते हों uh, लिखने वाले सो कॉल्ड मेन लैंड की इंटेलिजेंसिया में लिखने वाले ट्राइबल ग्रुप्स पे लिखने वाले नहीं जानते कि मिसमी भी तीन तरह के हैं तीन ग्रुप हैं उनके अंदर मिजो कोई एक ट्राइबल आइडेंटिटी नहीं है उसके अंदर ढेर सारी ट्राइब है जैसे नागा है वैसे ही तो नॉर्थ ईस्ट पर हम सामान्य तौर पर जो लोग रह रहे हैं सो कॉल्ड मेन लैंड में वो ऐसे ही देखते हैं उसी पर्सपेक्टिव से देखते हैं इसीलिए सैम का काम ज्यादा महत्वपूर्ण हो जाता है जैसा कि प्रोफेसर मकरन परांजपे ने भी कहा कि उसके काम में बहुत पोटेंशियल है एक और और एक एक बात और कहूं मैं क्यों महत्वपूर्ण है नागालैंड में नागा हो नागा कम्युनिटी का आदमी होना और उस पर काम करना और मणिपुर में नागा कम्युनिटी का आदमी होना और उस पर काम करना दोनों में बहुत फर्क है मणिपुर में जो नागा हैं वो एक तरह से इकोनॉमिकली सोशली और कल्चरली उनको थोड़ा मैतई लोगों ने थोड़ा सा उनको काट के रखा हुआ है नौकरियों में हो चाहे आर्थिक मौकों के मामले में हो तो मणिपुर के नागा ज्यादा समस्या फेस करते हैं बनस्पत के नागालैंड के नागा के और वहां मणिपुर की नागा हिल्स से एक हमारे मैंने एक आदमी निकल के आता है और वो आ, 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 हमारे बीच में एक बढ़िया काम अपने समाज के बारे में जो कि हम में से शायद कोई नहीं कर सकेगा डॉक्टर वेनुसा को छोड़ के मैं मैं जानता हूं कि जितने लोग फेलो हैं इस इंस्टीट्यूट में कोई भी शायद उतना डीपली जाके अः लोगों पर काम नहीं कर सकेगा जितना की डॉक्टर कामी सैमसन कर रहे हैं और अगर करेगा भी तो दिल्ली वाले चश्मे से उसको देखा करेगा इलाहाबाद के लखनऊ के चश्मे से उसको देखा करेगा इसलिए डॉक्टर कामई सैमसन का काम महत्वपूर्ण है इस लिहाज से बहुत महत्वपूर्ण है कि वहां की बात आनी चाहिए अब जबकि इस इंस्टीट्यूट ने डॉक्टर कामई सैमसन को एक महत्वपूर्ण मौका दिया काम करने के लिए तो फिर इस इंस्टीट्यूट में इतनी उदारता तो होनी ही चाहिए कि वह नियम 
के तहत ही उनको थोड़ा समय दे उनका उनके काम का इवेल्युएशन कराए उनके काम को जज कराए और जो समय मिलता है वो समय उनको दे ताकि वो काम कर सके एक काम जो आप तक आते आते रह जाएगा मैं तो हैरान होता हूं कि आ, कैसे हम इसको कैसे हमारे मन को ये झमझोलती नहीं है ये बात कि एक एक बढ़िया काम जिसको हमने दो घंटे तक सुना और उसपे एक अच्छी डिबेट की वो काम आते आते रह जाएगा उसमें कुछ अधूरापन रह जाएगा सिर्फ इसलिए क्योंकि हम अपने हृदय की उदारता को कम कर दिए हैं तो थोड़ा सा उदार होने की ही बात है थोड़ा सा उदार होने की जरूरत है और मुझे लगता है कि डॉक्टर कैमी सैमसन को इस प्रेजेंटेशन के लिए इस काम के लिए बहुत बधाई मिलनी चाहिए बधाई हम 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 सब लोग शुभकामना उनको देते हैं कि ये काम अच्छे से करें और उनको एक रिक्वेस्ट करते हैं आई प्रशासन से कि वह नियमों के तहत ही नियम मनुष्य के लिए है मनुष्य नियम के लिए नहीं है नियमों के तहत ही उनको एक मौका दे ताकि उनके काम का इवेल्युएशन हो और वो अच्छे से काम कर सके ये बात हम में से हर एक याद रखेगा इस उदारता को हम में से हर एक अपने जीवन भर याद रखेगा अगर ये डॉक्टर कैमरी सैमसन के साथ बढ़ती जाती है तो आ, सवाल पूछने का क्या है मैं आ, एक एक आखिरी आखिरी बात कहूंगा कि एक आखिरी बात कहूंगा कि सवाल तो हम दोनों खूब बात करते हैं आपस में तो आ, सवाल तो शॉर्ट आउट हो जाएंगे डिबेट कर लेंगे हम एक बात जिसको मैं केवल सबके सामने रख देना चाहता हूं मैं अरुणाचल प्रदेश में काम करता हूं वहां भी क्रिश्चियन मिशनरी बहुत बड़े पैमाने पे काम कर रही हैं और हिंदू संगठन भी वहां काम कर रहे हैं तो हम मैं भी इनको जज करने की कोशिश कर रहा हूं जज करना तो ज्यादा बड़ी बात होगी मैं भी इनको देखने की कोशिश कर रहा हूँ कि कौन कैसे काम कर मैंने ये पाया कि लोगों के अंदर ज्यादा बहस इस बात पर नहीं है कि कौन क्रिश्चियन है और कौन हिंदू उनके अंदर ज्यादा बहस इस बात पर है कौन कैसा काम कर रहा है किस तरीके से कर रहा है एक है जो कह देगा कि आप कोई मंदिर का प्रसाद आ रहा है तो मत खाइए मेरे कई वहां अरुणाचल में क्रिश्चियन दोस्त हैं जो कहते थे कि उनको कहा जाता है कि मंदिर का ये कोई भी प्रसाद हो तो हाथ में कोई दे दे तो नहीं खाना है और दूसरे से ये उम्मीद की जाए कि हिंदू ऑर्गेनाइजेशन भी अगर इस तरह का काम करेंगे तो वो कहते हैं इंडिजिनस लोग कि भाई हम तो उनको भी ऐसे ही देखेंगे जैसे मिशनरीज को देख रहे हैं अगर वो भी मना करेंगे हमको कि तुम चर्च में मत जाओ हम तो जाते हैं ऐसे ही जाते हैं आ, एक तो ये बात दूसरा ये कि हम लोग ये मजाक में कहते हैं कि चाहे ये जिस तरह का भी रूप दिखाई देता हो लेकिन हिंदू ऑर्गेनाइजेशन नॉर्थ ईस्ट में आ, उनके कई नेता जो हैं वो बीफ खाने का सपोर्ट करते हैं तो हम मजाक में कहते हैं कि नॉर्थ इंडिया में तो गौर अच्छा चल रही है और नॉर्थ ईस्ट में जो है आप आ, ये पलट लेते हैं लेकिन अगर ये इतना भी इतना भी मौका मिलता है कि हाँ वो बीफ खाने का सपोर्ट करते हैं आ, उनके कल्चरल आइडेंटिटी के साथ उनको चलाने की बात करते हैं तो ठीक है बाकी सैम से इस बारे में बात होती रहेगी मैं आ, मेरी ये इल्तिजा है कि उन्हें उन्हें जो है संस्थान अपनी उदारता दिखाते हुए काम करने के लिए एक वर्ष का मौका अवश्य दे धन्यवाद कमेंट नाउ यस सुमन कमेंट या थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू Oh uh, yeah so uh, first of all i congratulate sam for this very comprehensive presentation so um, my question is related to the idea of identity which you have taken up because uh, uh, as prasanjit has also raised this question about the complexities of identity and all so uh, i am using a word here it's called ipsty which has been used by a french thinker uh, his name is yon lacnancy so uh, when he uses this word ipsty uh, for identity it means that identity is not like a stone which remains unchanged mm -hmm. so uh, i mean you yourself have also pointed out the dynamic nature of uh, and the changing nature of identity so uh, in uh, your earlier part of presentation when you have said this thing that uh, uh, talking about the hindu organizations and its influence and all so that um, there will not be a kind of influence on the uh, zelalong people uh, like they will remain unchanged when they come in contact with that so i'll i'll uh, uh, i mean in this sense i want to say that when we are talking about this social identity so i think um, Uh, the idea of exchange and the encounter and uh, the difference and combat with the other 
not only in the negative sense but also in the positive sense should not be uh, uh, not neglected but still you know should be taken account for so in that sense i would say that saying that there will be no influence is uh, an early conclusion so uh, because you you have pointed out that you still have to work on your other chapters where you will be pointing out what is the role of uh, hindutva and hindu organizations and all so uh, i would say that please uh, reconsider this while you are working further on your project and for that i wish that you get more time uh, from the institute to work on your project so that you know uh, the the conclusion which you have given so you uh, kind of you know uh, think of more about it and probably in your next presentation we'll have more discussion about it so best wishes and uh, more time in the institute for you thank you thank you adil We cannot hear you, Adil. I think you have to. Who oh, unmuted? I'm audible now. Ah uh, yes. Yes yes. So first of all, congratulations, Dr. Samson, on very very scholarly presentation, and uh, uh, I think I, the importance of topic has been talked about very much by so many scholars, and I join everyone, including. Professor Pandey, Pandey, Professor Patel, Abhishek Yadav, and others, that he should be given ample time to finish his project. And I'm very, I, I hope that he will get. And that's the other. And the other part is that I have two questions. And first question is that um, when we talk about this Kalyan Ashram and all, so many people have talked about this. And uh, I think Dr. Alka has raised a pertinent question about this. And uh, if you talk about this kalyan ashram i think we should look into the pattern of their working nature right so in in your case if you are looking into the pattern of kalyan ashram in your community they must be working in some other part of this northern state and they were must be working in the mainland of like in uh, madh pradesh and maharashtra so you should be also looking into uh the pattern that they are i mean trying to develop or they have worked on probably i th i think that they have started working in uh, this uh, uh in your community or your 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 area they are in very in very early phase so uh, we don't know whether they will i mean proceed further in their uh, agenda or what we i mean you can say any other thing so first thing uh, you should look into it and the other thing in why do we romanticize the ancient uh, the native culture or the indigenous culture so uh, i'm asking this because the human civilization is the evolving civilization so can we consider that we should not i mean over emphasize on this romanticization of this uh, indigenous, indigenous culture and uh, once again thank you very much for this uh, scholarly presentation and i hope that you'll get time thank you very much if you could respond to this question, because this is, I mean, so, uh, you, you, as you have said that uh, you have finished only three chapters. So the, the question of Kalyan Ashram is a bit, I mean, needs a lot of data, a lot of field work. Uh, uh, if you could respond to these questions. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Adil, for bringing up this issue on the romanticization of the identity of the Zelenong people, of the tribal in general. But before that, uh, regarding this, the need to examine the pattern of the work of the Kalyan Ashram, not just in Manipur or Nagaland, but in other parts of the country. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, that should be that should be the way to conceptualize or to finalize my work. And in fact, I am going into that line of thinking that is very much a part of the lines of inquiry that I have, that to look into the nature of the work of Kalyan Ashram, which are working in other parts of the country. But again, uh, it is still yet to come. It is in the fourth chapter. And I have written very in a very sketchy manner 
and that needs a significant amount of time again. And it's very uh, unfortunate for me that I'll not be able to answer very satisfactorily to your question. And coming to that point of romanticization of uh, the identity of the tribal people, and which in fact is invariably accompanied with the idea of never changing, related to what Suman had also raised. In fact, I, I do not subscribe to the idea of a group or a cultural identity that never changes. In fact, I subscribe to the dynamic nature of group and even personal identity. Because uh, culture is one thing that can never remain static. But I, when I wrote, I in fact one, uh, I, I I had in fact uh, published one article on social change among the tribes of Manipur Valley. Social change among the tribes of Manipur Valley, in which I examine the idea of culture within the theoretical domain of social change. And I have conceptualized it uh, by taking into consideration of the essentiality of the dynamics of change, even in the domain of culture. And in doing so, I have, I have used two concepts. I mean, I have used two broad area in order to conceptualize the idea of change within the context of culture. It is uh, essence and practice. What I mean to say when I say essence and practice is that when we discuss, when we bring in the idea of culture within the theoretical concept of social change, it is not necessarily that everything of our culture is changed. It is not necessary. But it is also not to say that culture doesn't change. It changes, but the changes is at the changes happens at two levels, or at least at one level. When I say at least at one level, I mean that culture can change at least at practice level while retaining the essence. Meaning, I'll just give you the example. For instance, we have got a festival called Gangai, and it is celebrated continuously for five days. And one of the days includes the practice of uh, climbing the hill, wrong, who my wrong also means hill. So one of the days of these five days of festivals, we have got the practice of uh, climbing the hills. So now for those people like us or non-Christian Zelenon people who are settled in Manipur Valley, where will they go in order to <laughs> accomplish this one of the days of the festival where hill climbing is required? So now they retain the essence, they retain the meaning, they celebrate, they reiterate, they continue sharing the meaning of wrong, kumai, but they dance. Instead of climbing mm -hmm. the hill, they dance in a particular open space. So now here, here one cannot say that this aspect of this festival is completely changed because the essence is retained, but while the practice is changed. Now, another example I would like to give, during my data collection for my postdoctoral work, I met one elderly person from my village. He told me that he witnessed in my village in which there was a ritual being performed. And whenever we have a ritual, it must be noted in mind that animal sacrifice is very important. And though it is not uh, compulsory, very important, but not compulsory. So usually animal sacrifice, or at least a dry beef, a dry beef is required when we perform certain ritual. So he told me that in one of the rituals being performed in the village by the village priest, the owner of the family that had invited the priest to conduct a ritual took out jelly and uh, jelly and laddu. So for this ritual. So now why I'm saying jelly and laddu is because Jalevi and Ladu is never and um, had never been a part of the rituals of our community. We have got Kaswai and Kadam in the ritual. Kaswai means the prayer, the words used in the prayer. Kadam is the share that we give to the deities in whose name we perform the ritual. Now here, what I'm saying is that the prayers remain the same. The significance, why the ritual is performed remains the same. The significance, the belief 
why this ritual is performed remains the same, but the kadam, the items which are used, in fact, is not the meat. So in this way, the idea of chains, in fact, I do not roll out. I do not roll out. And I do not roll out in my conceptualization of the concept of culture. And I do not roll out even here in this uh, study. And coming back again to uh, Suman's question, why I say or why I uh, said it, it is very unlikely to change or it will not change meaning it, there will be no conversion amongst the non-Christian Jelenong people. In fact, it is based on my experience and as far as my experience is concerned, and as far as I speak based on my experience, there has been no conversion to any other uh, groups so far, despite their close associational relationship. And if things change in future, well, I have to get into that with fresh data. But as far as the data which is in my hand, based on that, I... That is what I was also pointing at, that you need more data for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think this has been a very fruitful discussion. Can you hear me? What okay. about conversion? Yeah, I think we can stop it for today and... All of us who are here, I think we keep bumping into each other. So we'll sir, continue uh, sir, uh, Professor Chahal is here. I mean, I oh. don't understand why he's, he's here. I mean, I can see his name. Professor <laughs> Chahal might be interested. Yeah. Yeah, he's very much here. So okay. I was thinking to wind up, but uh, if there is any pressing, one last observation or question, I can... Take. Just uh, two seconds, two seconds. Just to uh, just to mention one thing that it started at three o'clock and it is now five fifty-eight. That is three long hours. <laughs> That's a great thing. Okay, so thank you. Congratulations, Sam. I hope the wishes of all the fellows and uh, officials will be upon him. Professor I... Subhu is uh, trying to say something. I mean, this is... Hello, sir. Can I say something? Yeah, yeah please, okay. sir. Right. Yes. So if uh, the chair permits, I can always communicate. The point I wanted to make was about conversion. See, uh, people who studied actual conversions in India, like Richard E. Sir, we are losing you. Hello. I'm saying not. I think we can turn off our video for a while. <laughs> Hello. Maybe can, yeah, we can hear you now. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I just made point that conversion is not an overnight process of transformation. It happens over centuries, over decades. And digital and it's it's not a black to white or white to black. So the amount of negotiation that will be I think we are losing you, sir. Okay, I'll just make this point. Personally, whenever we meet, there's nothing. Yes, so... I think that's a that is suggestion. Uh, he needs a lot of input, specifically specifically on that particular point. Everyone has commented, I think, and your observations will help him to grow. So, thank you, Sam. You did your best. Thank you for your interesting, brilliant uh, observations and comments. Everyone, we'll call it a day. And thank you, Vanessa, so thank much you. for taking. Thank you, Sajid. Thank you very.
the session. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you to all my fellow. Chair, chair was excellent. <laughs> thank you to all my colleagues for productive feedbacks I have received, and I will work very religiously to further improve the work. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Good. Thank you. Thank you.